And this is your host of CivilNet, Eric Akopian, and we are truly honored today to have as our guest uh, the sociologist Gyorgy Derudugan, uh, a colleague and a friend and someone who I have the highest respect for in his opinions. Uh, and we're going to be discussing the culture of uh, war and uh, the culture of the post-war period and using very broad themes. Thank you, Professor Derudugan, for joining us. Thank you. Uh, the great Czech writer Milan Kundera wrote many years ago that the difference between large countries and small countries is, I quote, a small nation knows it can disappear uh, and knows about it. I read this many, many years ago and I understood this intellectually, but sometime over the last 50, 60 days, I understood it within the very essence of my being. And I understood how frightful that is. Uh, how do you explain what he's saying and whatever I and other people felt understanding what he's saying? Hmm. Let me say first, you know, that so did I. Everyone who survived, you know, those terrible, dreadful days here in Armenia felt very much the same. And it was for real. You know, it could disappear. You know, you suddenly look into an abyss. Uh, probably I have a different life experience. I was born in Russia, or what was then the Soviet Union. I was educated at a very elite university in Moscow. And I, when I was 20 years old, it looked like that Brezhnev will rule forever, that there will be another Brezhnev after this one dies that there will be always a parade on the Red Square on the 7th of November. Uh, and then, you know, everything was forever until it ended. As the famous book titled by my colleague, uh, Alexei Yurchak, who is professor at UC Berkeley, goes. So my generation actually has the experience of a sudden collapse of very big countries. And then there appears, you know, this tiny uh, Armenia. And I do remember, you know, the times I visited uh, back then doing my research when there was no fuel, there was no electricity. Uh, there was a massive demodernization. It was horrific, you know, that industry had disappeared almost overnight with all the employment, with all the skills associated with that industry. People had to leave or become peasants, or as they called at the time, shuttle traders. This higher stancy had to go to China, to Dubai, you know, buy something on the cheap, sell it with a tiny profit. Yeah, so you remember, and people were scrambling. It was a huge waste of human and material resources. And then there was still a war at, at the time. Bec uh, that war solidified the nation. That, was, that war was the only thing which actually kept it together because there was the realization that the nation could disappear you know, because that was the nation of survivors, of grandchildren of survivors of genocide. And that was the nation which took very seriously what happened in Sungait, you know, the pogroms in 1988, because they immediately knew, you know, that's it. It's again, we always said never again, but here it comes again. And let me remind you, you know, something very important you and I know, but probably our listeners might not know, that Vladimir Putin brought up Sumgait openly <laughs> twice. Yes, in one month. In one. Uh, speaking to political experts and then speaking to journalists, he did not have to. But first it shows that he knows and he understands, you know, so I took Putin much more seriously suddenly you know I, of course you know somebody is helping him with the briefs uh, that's how presidents function anywhere in the world however he chose it from the briefs mm -hmm. you know he understood what was going on and he understood the reaction of armenians and that was a message you know we can uh, as all the messages in politics you know, we can try to interpret because much of it is not intended for just one audience mm -hmm. However, it was a reminder, you know, that yes, we know that Armenians were very loyal to the Soviet Union for the very simple reason, you know, different nations had joined the Soviet Union more or less voluntarily. 
uh, they came from different levels of social development. You know, some uh, had already fairly developed uh, capitalism at the time, you know, the beginning of 20th century. Some of them, even in the Baltics, you know, for instance, had some, at least, you know, not democratic, you know, but uh, national states, functioning Bourgeois national states. National states yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there were people who were coming from tribal societies. Armenians came from beyond the grave. They came from the other world, you know, they came from after genocide, you know. So Armenians, in a sense, thrived in the Soviet Union. They were saved by the USSR and Armenians in Armenia, you know, they produced a splendid cohort of military commanders and scientists and such state leaders as Anastas Mikoyan. You know, so in my book about the economic prospects of Armenia, I have a section uh, under the title Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese Mikoyan. They're quite comparable. You know, the southerners, uh, both of them were southerners, both of them had spent long years inside a totalitarian Politburo. However, you know, both of them were always known to uh, be hospitable, by the way, as good southerners, you know, to cook well, but also to be pragmatic, to understand that you need to feed the people. So that was the realization of Deng Xiaoping, and that was the realization of Anastas Mikoyan within the Soviet Union. Uh, it did not go in that direction far enough. It began going already in the 1960s, and then during Perestroika, Gorbachev, and then Sumgait happened. And this is something very important. I was trying to explain to uh, experts in Russia, saying that, look, Gorbachev lost power not because he was in a nuclear confrontation with the United States. That absorbed enormous uh, effort in diplomacy, in military industrial sector. It was not uh, in the Soviet economy. The Soviet economy was, by modern standards, it was in a mild recession through the 1980s, you know, because of the oil prices, but it was a recession. It was not a crisis until 1990. So what really undermined Gorbachev was actually the chain reaction started by Sungaid. Because first, uh, I did a lot of research on this. Um, as a sociologist, I know that it doesn't really take uh, a conspiracy to produce a massacre. Why? You know, because there are certain conditions, and we know those conditions, I'm not going to, to get into a lecture here, but it could spontaneously ignite. However, this kind of violence was extremely mortally dangerous for the people in whose jurisdiction it occurred. That was the first secretary of Azerbaijan, Bagirov at the time. And I have evidence, you know, that he was extremely scared in the first hours and days. He was hoping that he would be just dismissed and not shot publicly, you know, for what had happened. And then the reaction of Gorbachev was very weak, you know, nothing happened. We can speculate, you know, that he was probably not willing to get too obliged to his KGB secret police or to the military, you know, but he did very little. And then uh, massacre and pogrom enter the repertoire of political action, at least in the southern republics of the USSR. Uh, it suddenly becomes possible, you know, to bring women to confront the paratroopers in Tbilisi with casualties, and that was probably already a provocation, you know, that immediately ended any legitimacy of Soviet control in Georgia. Uh, it became possible to attack the Mischeti Turks in Uzbekistan. A uh, few people might even remember now, but that ended the control, the Soviet control over Uzbekistan. You know, and then in Chechnya, secret police buildings were seized by crowds. Uh, you know, when KGB could be attacked with impunity, KGB building, its armory was seized, but not only armory. We are pretty sure that its archives, with the names of all the spies, agents, you know, snitches, were probably seized by someone else. Um, that not only destroys legitimacy of a state, that destroys the loyalty of the people inside this apparatus, you know. So, what are we serving? You know, will they be able to protect us? So I think you know this is what led in just three years to the collapse of Soviet Union, to all this parade of sovereignties. When Ukraine and Kazakhstan say that we are exiting, 
you know, the Soviet Union. Not just Lithuania. Lithuania, they, they would have survived. You know, but Ukraine, they could not survive. So I think when Gorbachev uh, missed uh, the opportunity uh, to show force when it was necessary, when he showed indecisiveness, that became a lesson for Putin. So Putin probably understood, you know, what was going on because Putin obviously is very concerned not to allow the repetition of collapse of Soviet Union. So this is why we got Russian troops with such spectacular rapidity, you know, so that operation, if, if you noticed. Very quick. It was very quick and it was very efficient. We all hear it overnight with the flights overhead. Forty flights without a railroad, you know, it was spectacular, you know, so they brought the armor, they brought the trucks, heavy equipment, and we suddenly saw a different Russian army, not the kind of army we saw in Chechnya even in no. 2008. So we saw the kind of military that was not entirely seen in the Crimea in 2014, but this is kind of the reformed uh, leaner and meaner Russia. And this is where we are now. Uh, I wanted to, uh, there's been something to me that has struck me is uh, there's a generational split and uh, that is very fascinating in Armenia now. I have talked to many reporters, uh, former Western soldiers who were journalists in Karabakh, uh, military analysts, and they all uniformly will have different opinions about the different levels of failure on, on, or what the results, or what the war meant. But to the last person, uh, these are different people, they have all told me the one thing that did not fail were uh, the conscript army of 18, 19 year olds. They are uniform in saying that. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, all at the same time, you see that these very young people, almost boys, you know, who have become men, making political stances to the extent that they're sending videos, or putting or coming to town and essentially telling everyone you know, what are you guys doing? What are you focused on? Why are you, uh, what are you demonstrating about? Don't you know we needed to end this war? It's almost this, they, they show a level of maturity to me that is fascinating. Uh, at the same time, what we see, what we have all collectively seen among the military and political leadership is a total failure, blame game. No one is taking complete responsibility when, mm -hmm when even rational political thought will tell you, you take, uh, you take responsibility and you go, I'll take even more responsibility, you know, put it on me. And you get to win people over like that. But I want to step back. What does it say about a culture in which the wisdom is with the 18, 19 year olds and all the political and military leaders are acting like fools? What does it tell us? Well, this tells us that different generations have different formative experiences. And the formative experience of the generation of the first Karabakh war was the late Soviet Union. So it was predominantly intelligentsia, as you remember. Uh, many of them highly educated, if not extremely over-educated in the 1980s. Uh, that probably helped. You know, and, uh, by the way, you know, Armenia is quite unique among the former Soviet republics in having intelligentsia, you know, Levon Ter Petrosyan's group staying in power for almost nine years. You know, in Moscow, it was about four months. You know, in 1991, Lushkov, you know, so this strong uh, fatherly figure, you know, for um, 15 years I used to teach in Chicago. So I used to uh, tell my students, you know, that uh, you really don't need uh, a very complex uh, political theory to explain the kind of power that had emerged from the collapse of Soviet Union. Any mayor of Chicago would figure it out in, in five minutes. It's a political machine. There were ward leaders and you reward those people, you control them. So it worked very in a robust and primitive ways. So the generation which we have now had their formative experience in the uh, horrible years of the late 1990s in the collapse. They never got proper education. I'm not going to point fing fingers. 
you know, to whom. But now many people say that you know, they spend too much time you know, hopping from one stipend in the West to another. Exactly, you know, but where would they go you know, for good education? You know? So you, they spend maybe you know, a couple months here, a semester there. Uh, they got some education again. You know, what kind of education was, was that in the 1990s at best? You know, when so many good professors had left the country, there were no textbooks. And by the way, there was a very, let's recognize it, you know, a very damaging process of uh, transferring everything into Armenian language. It was very patriotic. However, there were no textbooks of It limited physics. your worldview. Yeah. Uh, and what kind of skills do you get? You know, when the world was shifting uh, higher education to English, we were shifting it away from Russian and from English by implication, you know, very few people actually, those who learned English well, unfortunately, they also got the skills, you know, to leave the country. Um, so now we have a new generation and that generation has nothing in common with either the, you know, the experience of the people in the uh, 1990s who either Levon Terpet Rossian's group, you know, who had to play by the rules. There were very few, uh, the rules of the game were very brutal. You know, you control the people through uh, controlling, you know, giving them control over pieces of former Soviet property. Since nothing was very legal, you know, so this is even better, you know, so you weaken the police, you weaken the prosecutorial uh, apparatus. Uh, in order that they wouldn't catch the president himself you know, and his cronies. So it became chronic capitalism. Uh, Levon Terpetrosian lost his power you know, because that chronic capitalism was not working very well for him. It was too transparent you know, to many people and amidst such a ruin, I wonder actually what kind of a genius could have held to power or what kind of a dictator. And fortunately, I must say something you know, to the credit of both uh, Ter Petrosian and his successors, actually, uh, especially Serge Sarkisian, they didn't consolidate a dictatorship, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as you mentioned, I think, you know, uh, in one of your talks, that there are nowhere portraits of presidents in Armenia, right? So this is very different from Turkey, you know. There are no Ataturks anywhere, there are no statues, there are no airports named after them, uh, because there was serious resistance from the population. And then that resistance exploded in 2018, and that explosion, uh, I would say, was quite healthy. It uh, tried to clear the stagnant waters, but it left them mudded. Because it was not quite uh, evident, you know, what should they do next. Mm -hmm. You know, just fight the corruption. And now we have this new generation who we don't know yet, because days have passed. But that generation is there, it's for sure. Uh, the generation who matured very young, the generation of uh, martyrs and heroes, you know, the people who saw hell, the people who felt betrayed by the system which sent them into combat. The system was dysfunctional, you know, they, they, they felt it on, on their own shoulders. And yet, they kept on fighting. And this is something very, let me uh, finish this with um, an observation which struck me as a sociologist. You know, it's very important to notice something which nobody notices, you know, because it's so evident. It's like the air around you. You start realizing that there was air when there is none. Uh, it's improbably safe in the streets of Yerevan. It's very safe for women too. So we take it for granted. Mm -hmm. But uh, I bring my friends from other countries, you know, to, to show Yerevan. And like you, I'm not from here. You know, I chose to be here because I think you know this is this would be a very good place to, to live. You know, so a friend of mine who is a very high p positioned intellectual in Israel, an Israeli, you know, came here, looked around, and said, okay, it's very much like us, but do you realize this is not Middle East? I said, what do you mean? I said, uh, this is not the Middle East. You know, this is Eastern Europe. Uh, this is actually quite European, you know, much more. Uh, the, pay, uh, the way people bargain, for instance, it's haggle, 
you know, it's not Lebanon, it's not Jordan or Egypt. You know, the, uh, the way you pay in taxes. So that, and your young men behave very differently. You know, so they're way well uh, behaved, especially towards women. So the, this, this is a major indicator uh, that they behave in a much more civilized manner. And then he looked around and said, this is where you're going to retire? So at the time, and it was several years ago, it sounded like a joke, so yeah, I would like to retire. Said, I approve. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to... We know we're talking about very uh, broad things here, and I was struck with something during the war. There was an Italian journalist who made an observation that in the hurly-burly of the war, I wasn't thinking too much about. But he had come back from Karabakh and he said, there's a difference between your young people and our young people, talking about Westerners. He said that uh, uh, your young people are still willing to uh, fight and for die for things that our young people in the West are no longer willing to do. First of all, do you agree with him? And second of all, if he's correct, what does that tell us about the West specifically? And what does that tell us about us? It tells us that the West became uh, a fairly safe place, fortunately. It tells us also that um, we are backward, in a sense, and we have an advantage of backwardness. Because we still fight patriotic wars. We still realize that the country can disappear. Uh, I don't think very many people you know, are worried you know, that their country could disappear or actually you know, they might rejoice. <laughs> I, I'm not going to name the countries, you know, but quite, quite... I think we know which ones. <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, in a, another observation. In April 2016, in the previous you know, the kind of dress rehearsal for this war, when Azerbaijan attacked the, the last time, uh, a good friend of mine filmed uh, just for less than one minute, the faces of soldiers in a platoon that a few hours earlier had survived a night attack by armor, by enemy armor. Kids, you know, 1920, and probably, you know, 30, it's very difficult actually to tell. You know, so you see their commander with a scar on the face when he turns. And he looks like the closest thing I could ever imagine to a Roman centurion. Mm -hmm. Kind of, you know, the men who spent mm -hmm. years in trenches. I sent these, you know, and just one face after now silently. And you can just hear birds chirping, you know, because the war has just ended. I began suddenly getting very unusual kind of emails from women in their 30s in the West, you know, writing, you know, could I meet one of these uh, soldiers, you know, I am, I'm American or I am Austrian, I have a good cow farm in the mountains in the Alps, uh, so it's uh, a banker from Paris, a female bank, very, very successful. Uh, this is insane, and as I write to them, you know, that, you know, that first of all, you know, they're village boys and they're 19 year old, you know, so uh, they look, of course, you know, beyond their age, you know, to your Western eye. But then I began thinking, you know, so why, you know, these women, you know, so go crazy, you know, because there is the call of the nature. And so here are males you can have children with, <laughs> right? <laughs> and <laughs> dependable, strong males. So I started thinking uh, differently, you know, so actually, you know, I would like to have uh, more psychologists look at this, you know, so what are the traits? You know, they're silent, you know, they don't say anything, you know, these kids, yeah, you know, but it, it works uh, at a very subliminal, uh, very strong message, mm -hmm. you know, without words, you know. So what is the message? I'm a macrosociologist, so I cannot tell you, you know, but there is something. You know, uh, in our conversations, since I'm a, I'm, I come from politics and you come from academia. I always uh, take liberties and you always push back on me and put me in my place, which is good because uh, I need that. But I, I have a concept and an idea and I wanted to see what you think of it. Uh, obviously, this war had very obvious conflicts as far as whose side was what and for reasons that geographic, historical, we know about all of that. But when I look at the behavior 
uh, or the language, most, lang most specifically the language and the actions. I think there's an element that uh, the Azeri state and that the actions of the Turkish, and that's just the way they're approached to war, I think it's fair to say it, it's, it's fascist in nature. And what I mean by that is the language that was used, we're going to chase them like dogs, uh, deliberate targeting twice of a religious site, a cultural site that was definitely on purpose. Uh, the barbarism that we have all seen, beheading, some of that, some of that is normal, unfortunately, in war. But, uh, and what struck me was this very deliberate purpose of humiliation of signing this ceasefire agreement. It has to be on camera. You know, I don't care if Pashinyan signs it in a warehouse. It was almost like, you know, Hitler dragging the French into that train, you know, into that famous train to sign the armistice in 1940. Uh, and I see that, and I see that in their actions, I see it in their language. Uh, am I on to something, or am I just using that fascist phrase too lightly because people drag it into everything? I would leave fascism to uh, the period of the 1930s and early 1940s. You know, this is more like revanchism. You know, there are elements which are very similar. Kind of the previous humiliation and in um, in sociology, this is sometimes, uh, in some theories in sociology, this is called forward panic. You know, cruelty shown to uh, the people whom you actually fear, you know, because they're everywhere. You know, they used to be Jews, of course, in you know, the first half of 20th century. That's, by the way, why uh, much of intellectual higher end Azerbaijani propaganda, unfortunately, sounds very anti-Semitic and very similar to it. Uh, so they, they recycle the same uh, figures of speech. Of course, you know, this is uh, also very much a censored um, public space mm -hmm. in the neighboring country. So we cannot be quite sure, you know, so I remind you, you know, so, uh, that there are great writers like Akram Ailis Lee, you know, the Stone Dreams, mm -hmm. you know, it's an Azerbaijani writer who felt ashamed, you know, of what was happening and was trying to extend you know, a hand to Armenians. You know, so could we try to reconcile? Uh, if you remember, you know, a member of Azerbaijani parliament offered a money reward, 15 some, uh, something, you know, thousands of dollars to someone who would be daring enough to cut off the old man's ears. Uh, what does it tell you about kind of, you know, the, the, the culture which is cultivated? And I think you know, it's cultivated. Uh, it's genuine uh, at some popular level, I'm afraid. Um, we find it in many uh, societies at similar levels of development uh, after humiliation, and there was a humiliation for Azerbaijan in the previous war. However, I do think it was quite deliberately maintained and cultivated by the official propaganda. There is a big propaganda machine there was a lot of money and effort it, it put into it. The product uh, was quite ugly and often clumsy, as we know, but it was massive. And that propaganda actually coincided with certain uh, uh, currents in the society. But then at the top, of course, you have Ilham Aliyev, who speaks in the first singular. I destroyed the status quo. I did, I gave orders, I salute the people who support my policy, you know, so this is, uh, I wouldn't call it a fashion, you know, this is a sultanate, or an at attempt to legitimate, uh, hey, it's a family rule, you know, so it's, it's uh, not, in many respects, you know, Azerbaijan uh, doesn't look like uh, a modern state. You know, this is a family controlling the oil fields and for better or for worse, there is a country with a population coming with those oil fields, right? And you have to manage that country somehow because otherwise it could get actually dangerous, you know, for you. So I would say that we find this kind of uh, uh, propaganda and mass attitudes in many Middle Eastern uh, presidencies for life as they are you know, life presidents, as, as they are mildly called in Western political science. 
right? and that actually is a dangerous side, you know, because very few, if any, of those presidencies for life in the Middle East ever ended peacefully. And they all have their Gaddafi moment. Exactly. You know, or the Shah of Iran. Yeah. Uh, what are the things that I have, uh, has uh, saddened me is, you know, I, I've given, whenever I give my interviews and I get feedback and people will tell us, uh, you know, give, essentially in so many ways, in different ways, some more articulate than others, they ask me to provide a vision. And I am the last person that should be providing a vision. That's not my job. And it's not even within my capabilities necessarily to do that. Uh, and I'm, 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 I come back to Proverbs, and this is my last question to you. Uh, you know, there's a great line in Proverbs, is without a vision that people perish. And we have the one thing that is lacking from, and this is across the political board, it's not even taking sides or anything. Uh, you know, the opposition is even more pathetic than the people in power. Mm -hmm. The people are waiting for a vision. Uh, maybe they shouldn't wait for a vision. Maybe they should come up with a vision of their own. Uh, because if the leadership, uh, the quality uh, of our people, especially young people, is, is, is above the category of our leadership. Uh, if I was to ask you, what should the vision be to the extent that you can tell us what the vision should be? Okay, you got me. Since some 20 years ago, I was recognized as a Carnegie Scholar of Vision. <laughs> it's on my CV. Uh, look, vision is very much what's a great chess player. Say, think of Aranyan or Tigran Petrasyan in the past. And say that, okay, so you are losing this game now. Turn around and let's try to see, you know, how, how can we improve the position from this situation here? Uh, I would say that we, we hear now a lot of noise and that noise is the crashing of the political system with, it, with its elites. We hear lots of uh, yells for this reason, wails, uh, because the choice is awful, as you have just described. The choice is between the people from the 1990s and the people from the early 2000s or something. We need the people from the future. Uh, in part, that's a generation that you just described, you know, these young soldiers, but not only soldiers. There are lots of people who are trying to do what governments actually should do otherwise, you know, in, under normal circumstances, you know, procuring helmets, uh, build, build, building uh, machinery for hospitals, you know, medical supplies. You know, they build them, and you know, they don't buy them. So I, I know examples, you know, when people uh, who are otherwise, you know, startup geniuses, you know, they probably otherwise would be quite successful by now, you know, but they, they go into this in the last uh, month and a half and start building um, uh, medical rehabilitation machinery, which is a whole order of magnitude cheaper than even Chinese. You know, they improvise, you know, they, they take from each other, you know, so there are these people. And then there is the diaspora. You know, the people who are asking me, uh, how could we help quicker, there is certain disbelief in big structures, you know, could we deliver, say, money, you know, at least, you know, what could we do, you know, money, could we send money, you know, directly, you know, to the people you identify. By the way, speaking of diaspora, um, you know, there were doubts for many years how Armenian I am, because frankly, you know, my, I had no choice, uh, or control over the choices of my grandfather who married a Don Cossack woman a century ago, and over the married choice of my father, who married a uh, Kuban Cossack. I am actually two-thirds uh, North Caucasus Cossack, and Armenian was my grandfather. I am professor at New York University. My books were translated into 17 languages, by the way, including Turkish. Do you know what I have in common with Kim Kardashian? We are both Armenians. <laughs> no, that's all. You know, so we have a much bigger diaspora than we thought. 
actually, or differently structured. There are people who are probably 100% genetically Armenian on both sides, but who never attend any Armenian gatherings. You know, who, it's always like that. You know, of course, you know, the people who have the choice, because diaspora, uh, living in America or in France, well, in America I know just better, you know, because I lived in America for 25 years, uh, that you have a choice on Sunday, going to Armenian church or uh, to a picnic or uh, mowing your lawn in front of the house, right, you know, so, or relaxing. Uh, here, in a small country like Armenia, there is less choice, but there are, however, you know, the people from the diaspora are very committed, you know, because there is self-selection. You know, if you feel Armenian still being somewhere in Watertown or in New York City, you know, you are very much Armenian uh, all over the world. And I do think, you know, we can manage, you know, so I see four time horizons there. One month, one year, five years, and 25 years. So one month, we must prevent, we must actively prevent the collapse of political system in Armenia. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, because we must take over, we must allow, preserve the channels for taking over the reins of the government for some new forces. They must have time to uh, coalesce, but the last thing we need now is to either restore somebody from the past, you know, because they screwed up in the past. We know this, you know, the country deteriorated. They built an economy of restaurants and casinos, uh, offshore stashed away cash somewhere in Cyprus. Uh, we don't trust, you know, the current authorities, you know, but they have failed miserably, which means, you know, that we must preserve the opportunities, the legal opportunities, mm -hmm. for someone else to come and to call legal us. Change. Legal change. One month. So this is political horizon. One year, it's survival horizon because it's going to be tough for everyone. And you know, very few people in the world, fortunately perhaps, understand what is going to be the crushing blow of the year 2021 to the world economy. We don't know yet, you know, economists are freaking out uh, because of the COVID pandemic, because of the disruption of world trade. Well, we shall see actually, you know, who suffers more, you know, because Armenia might be closer to the bottom than its neighbors, you know, but hey, you know, Turkey massively dependent on tourism, Azerbaijan dependent on oil prices, you know, so we shall see, you know, how, how we survive. But let me tell you now, now it's going to be very difficult, you know, so my message to fellow Armenians, if you have any money, you will go in, to do repairs and a renovation to your home, do it, you know, give jobs to people. And the government must do the same, you know, public works, you know, employ, you know, the poor, you know, make sure that they don't despair and they don't leave the country. So the next year is going to be difficult. It's economic horizon. Five years is the state rebuilding and the economy rebuilding because economy cannot be rebuilt without the state. We have a lot of great talent around the world. Right? I personally, I'm not going to name names. You know, I just named Kim Kardashian, you know, that's one person I don't know. But uh, you probably know, I have very impressive contacts. Mm -hmm. uh, I can bring many of these contacts. People are asking me, you know, we can come, we know what to do with the legal system, we know how to reform the military, we know how, what to do with the finance. Uh, who is going to listen to the advice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, who is going to implement it here in Armenia. They must be young Armenian citizen. So the next horizon is the rebuilding of the country. Very serious upgrade. That might include actually even the national symbols, you know, because our anthem, flag, uh, the coat of arms, they actually come from the tragic First Republic. And then in 1991, you know, they were restored simply because it was, you know, there was no time and it was another tragic period in history. Uh, they are not very well designed, you know, we have better music by Aram Khachaturian, for instance, you know, but we will see, think, you know, about many such things. And then 25-year horizon, if all goes well, if we have a new national state with new flag, probably, with new army, with new economy, with new elite, with new education, and I can go on, you know, so what, what must be new, I wrote a whole book uh, about what could be done, what should be done, where are the uh, opportunities, and then 25 years. 
demographic transition. The country has demodernized. You know, so many people here are despairing, you know, that villages are decrepit, you know, they're falling apart. Of course they're decrepit, you know, there is no investment. And people live there very much like peasants, and they used to vote like all peasants, you know, for the local boss. Caudillo, whatever you call it in Cacique. Spanish. Yeah, cacique. Yeah. Uh, like somewhere in Sicily. So that is dying out, and actually we should help it, you know. So the question should not be, how should we bring young people back to Armenia or back to villages? The question should be, how could we make Armenia more attractive to younger people, and not necessarily younger people, you know, retirees like myself. So what would it take, and in 25 years there should be a different demographic structure in Armenia, uh, much more modern, 21st century. So to repeat, one month we must preserve the political openness. openness. Uh, one year we must preserve the economy, we must survive this difficult year. Five years, rebuild the state. 25 years, come up with a new demographic. That sounds like a uh, political platform for a party. Well, let's invent a name. Uh, are you a citizen? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Professor Erlugan, it was a pleasure having you. And uh, I'm glad that when we last time we spoke, it was a far more dire days. I would say they're better days, but at least I think the worst of the days have passed us, I'm hoping. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You said many important things yourself. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, this is your host of uh, Civil Debt, Eric Kopian, and thank you for joining us.